and uh, hello everyone and welcome uh, to the CC Roundtable Communication for Development Rethinking Participation in a Post-COVID-19 World. Uh, my name is Adharul Choudhury. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Environmental Design and Rural Development at the University of Guelph. Uh, I will be facilitating this session. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Guelph is situated in the traditional territory of the neutral and Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, and Métis people. And today, uh, this place is home to many First Nations. And acknowledging them reminds us of our important connection to each other and our shared responsibility to this land where we live, learn, and work. I will be recording the session of this event. So I'm, I think the recording button already hit it. So I will be recording in the cloud. And uh, I like to mention that uh, this round table is part of our webinar series, uh, Rethinking Participation in the Digital Age of Communication for Development and Social Change. We organized this uh, webinar series as part of our Shark Connection um, grant. And in the first of the part of the series, uh, we explore uh, the basic concepts and principles of participation. And then I identified some non-negotiable component of participatory process. And in the second part, we introduced various online tools and methods used for uh, participation and community engagement process. And in this part of today that we are going to organize as part of CCA Roundtable, we will focus on the question, how do we consider participation in the digital age of, of post-COVID-19. Uh, let me share the link for uh, last two session. You might find it um, interesting. Um, let me share the chat box. Yeah, so I, I shared the um, link from uh, last year, last two part of um, our webinar series. And um, so um, today, the, the way we organize the event uh, to, to be informative and, you know, more engaging, engaging way. So we have four presenter, uh, Dr. Catherine Reilly will reflect on uh, participation in the digital sphere using the lens of heteromation. It is a concept that explains how the machine influences people to contribute uh, to the digital sphere. Then Dr. Thea Tyrrell and Thea Arnetta will discuss a communication situation analysis for a disaster risk communication project for which they have to uh, change from face-to-face -to, -face to online uh, methodology. And finally, Dr. Helen Hamley will bring her perspective on connectivity access and civic participation based on her work on rural broadband initiatives in Ontario. Uh, each presenter will present for a maximum of 15 minutes. Uh, I suggest that you invest more time in discussion and we will have uh, followed by each presentation, we have five to seven minutes for discussion. And Dr. Ricardo Ramirez will join us for each discussion part as a discussion. Um, and we will also take questions from, from our um, audience. I hope Catherine is here and uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Catherine Reilly for her presentation. Hi, sorry for, um... oh, hold on a second. I'm gonna, um... Get my screen going here. Okay, there we go. Uh, thank you, Adhural, and sorry for arriving late. I have my research group meetings on Friday mornings, and so I was running from one thing to another. Um, and there we are very much a mediated transnational research network, so very apropos to what we're talking about today. So um, 
Today, I'm going to talk about media, mediated participation in the digital platform economy. And I'm going to talk about three communicative processes that I see as um, integral to understanding the way in which um, our social processes get mediated. And they are datafication, logistics, brokerage, and as Adahruel mentioned, um, heteromation. Um, so, uh, sorry. Um, the question that's been posed to us today is what does it mean to participate in development in a post COVID world from the perspective of communication for development. So I want to start by taking a minute to talk about how I am thinking about participation and how I'm thinking about development in this case. And um, I think um, I'm taking a broader perspective um, than a specific uh, participation or consultation that somebody might do or a specific moment of participation or consultation, but my hope is that it'll provide a kind of a larger backdrop for um, maybe some of the presentations that we'll have in the rest of the round table. So first of all, in terms of participation, we see lots of different um, perspectives on participation in the development uh, literature. Um, so one of the questions that arises is, are people able to participate in development? How do they participate? And there is a lot of study around that set of questions. A second, um, more critical set of questions then is, should they participate in development? And you know, when should they participate? And when should they not participate? Um, but the perspective that I'm really grounding my thinking in is how does um, actual participation constitute our historical reality? So um, in particular, how does this uh, participation shape socioeconomic relations such as um, relations of inequality? So that's how I'm thinking about participation, which has implications for how I'm thinking about development. And so certainly I recognize that development is and has been a geopolitical project that it's accompanied by a series of discourses as per you know, the positioning of someone like Arturo Escobar. And um, I also understand that development can be mobilized as a process of social change like Mohan Datta tells us, or um, that takes place through a pluriverse of different uh, approaches, again, drawing on Escobar. But, for me, um, I like to think about development as the condition of, again, that sort of historical reality, the condition of the tensions that enable or constrain these historical processes. So I very much like um, the work of Escobar and his notions of pluriverse, and I like the work of Data and his notions of social change. But um, for me, they are suspended within a set of historical relations that enable or constrain or speed up or slow down those processes of historical change. And that's how I think about development. So with that in mind, in this presentation today, I'm going to work with um, a framework that's offered by two Colombian scholars, um, Martin Barbero and Omar Rincon. So uh, Omar Rincon is Martin Barbero's um, student, and they are um, key foundational communications theorists from Latin America. And they offer us a very um, interesting epistemological of way of thinking about the constitution of this set of historical processes or this set of socioeconomic relations that manifests in a particular moment. So what they suggest is that um, in any given moment, we live in a particular sensorium, which is a culture of knowing. And so the way communications manifests allows us to know ourselves and our human experience in a particular way. And in particular, Rincon offers that technology changes how this takes place through the mediation of the epistemic processes that give rise to culture. In other words, uh, culture is the result of a knowledge process. We, it's how we know and it's also what we know and what knowledge gets circulated. Um, and then they suggest that we live in a particular cultural mutation, a particular moment of how we know time and place. So the sensorium manifests in a particular historical place and time, and it reflects the arrangements of power and resistance to them of that time, as well as the particular communicative modalities of that time and place. So that's the kind of perspective that I'm bringing to this question of uh, participation and development. 
Um, so Martin Barbero and Rincon um, have theorized the cultural mutation of the current moment, right? So they're saying this is the sensorium, this is the way we know ourselves, this is the way we produce our knowledge of ourselves, this is how we know our culture in the current moment. This is a little bit of um, a difficult um, diagram to take in. It's quite complicated. But, and, and I'm working on it myself. In fact, I think this presentation today you're going to see is me trying to work through what this theory offers us. But um, basically what you're seeing here is the idea that the technicities that we experience through um, different institutional realities are um, in tension with our experience of them. And so this is sensibilities and technicities on the horizontal axis, and um, they co-produce each other. And so if you think about something like your experience on Facebook, um, Facebook has certain ways of shaping our experience of time and place, and they produce certain emotions for us. And in particular on Facebook, for example, um, there is a, a, a business model that is based on selling advertising and our attention is held in that space because we are scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And um, we experience that as maybe like having our emotions jerked and we are constantly seeing new pieces of information and we're expected to react really quickly to that information because it's scrolling past it provokes us we're meant to react with a like or a comment and we can be um end up finding our practices our citizenship practices and our expressions of identity to be quite reactive um, and so this is how our affect gets provoked and how it gets expressed so this is what's being um uh uh, represented in this diagram. So with that as kind of a starting point, what I'd like to do now is just share some of my emerging thoughts about participation in the digital platform economy and how this might affect our experience of development. And uh, as I say, um, this is kind of a, a broader thought thinking about participation than participation in a specific event. Um, so first, what do I mean by the digital platform economy? Just a quick review here. I'm talking about technologically mediated spaces of networked interaction um, in which producers and consumers are networked with each other uh, for the achievement of particular ends. So if you think of something like Uber, it's the, the person's providing the, the car ride and the person who needs to get somewhere, finding each other with the purpose of providing a service of transportation, yeah? Um, but what's really important about this is that the platform occupies a strategic position in the digital platform economy. So Chernick offers us this really helpful definition. In this situation, data forms the ground upon which activities occur. So the platform has the privilege of being able to record all of our activities. If we were making this, you know, the analogy to a farmer's market, in that farmer's market, um, people would arrive and they would set up their um, stalls and they would have trans in transactions and interactions with individuals that would be essentially private private transactions. But in a platform economy, both the buyer and the seller um, have to pay a fee to be present, to have a stall or to shop at the farmer's market. And the platform gets to monitor every single interaction that takes place in the farmer's market and gather information about all of those transactions. So what was sold, what was bought, what was paid, uh, even the conversations that take place. So it's a very powerful strategic position. And um, they get to use their algorithms um, to control and govern those interactions. And they are driven to um, grow the size of the market because the more people who are inside that platform, um, the more successful the platform is, the more valuable it becomes, and also the more they can gather data and, and, um, and monitor those transactions. So it's this kind of scenario that I'm thinking of when I think of the digital platform economy. So in order to you know, connect this framework to that idea of a series of interactions, a set of technicities that are giving rise to a set of sensibilities and constructing our experience of time and space, 
We need to know what are the communicative mechanisms that are at work here that tie this all together. And so this is where these three ideas that I um, listed in the, the title to this talk come in. So these are the communicative processes that are at work in the digital platform economy that I think are um, really important. So um, the three of them are datafication, logistics brokerage, and heteromation. Datafication, I think we all have a pretty good hold over, right? So this is the idea that our social reality gets transformed into data points and they are digitized. And there's a lot of work being done right now about well, what does that actually mean for how we are represented within these spaces and how, how we are presented. I think there's also a lot of discussion about how datafication um, is a very um, occidental philosophy of knowledge because um, we are looking at individuals and their individual representation. It's not based in communal um, relationships. Um, it's not based in a communal ontology of, of how people, so your data is presented as a representation of you, not as something that emerges out of your social relationships and your social ties, for example. So um, this is one piece. A second piece is logistics brokerage. Logistics brokerage is um, the commodification of the process of organizing social interactions and transactions. So one of the great sort of innovations of the platform economy is that it makes things fine you can go on Etsy and you can find that person who produces that very specific, special, um, uh, bespoke item that you're looking for. So um, these platforms broker the problem that logistics of finding each other, somebody who needs a ride and somebody who can provide a ride. And then finally, we have the communicative process of heteromation. So there's this huge discourse in the world today about automation and this fear that computers are going to automate work processes and we're all going to be out of work. But I really like the work of Ekbia and Nardi, who argue that actually it's quite different, that um, it's not that computers are putting it up, us out of work. It's the, com the computerization or the digitization or um, you know, mechanization of processes is repositioning our working relationship with information systems. So where in the past, um, maybe um, people would have paid jobs as part of institutional arrangements to do certain work, um, in the platform economy, we're doing a lot of um, sort of administrative work for free in the service of the production of these information systems. And so it's not one producer, automation or automatic, uh, a solo automatic producer, but rather it's a diversity of people who are coming together in a network to produce an output. And an example of this is when we train algorithms through participating in those dumb Facebook polls, which are asking us, what do you see in this picture? And we all answer because we think we're doing something fun on Facebook, but what we're really doing is training an algorithm how to understand human thought processes. So we're doing the work of training the AI and we're not getting paid for it. So um, going back to this diagram, the idea is to put datafication, logistics, brokerage, and heteronation in this set of relationships and then think it through. And um, so these are my initial thoughts on how to think this through. And I'm drawing here on research that I'm doing in the field in Latin America right now. So the question would be, how does datification shape how we know ourselves and our reality and social um, in, in, in our reality in this context? So how does our participation in the platform economy and the communicative process of datification that takes place when we participate in the platform economy um, shape our knowledge of ourselves and our knowledge of our social process? And how does this produce culture? That's the question that I'm answering. So in one of my um, projects, um, one of my study groups that's part of my project right now, um, they are looking at people sharing their personal data at the moment when they buy contraceptives at a pharmacy. And this is a project that's happening in Lima. And some of the results that are emerging from this are that at the moment of sharing their personal data at the pharmacy, those individuals 
experience confusion and skepticism and vulnerability. They feel these feelings of, um, you know, confusion. Why, why do I have to share my personal data? I don't see a clear purpose here. I don't see why you need to know these things about me in order for me to buy my contraceptives. I don't understand how the data is going to be used. It makes me feel like a means to an end rather than as somebody who's in a relationship with a pharmacist who cares about me and my health. Um, and then um, there is a suspicion that the databases are actually their loyalty programs rather than um, healthcare information systems. And so the databases are designed to advance the economic um, stability and position of the pharmacy chain, rather than to um, ensure that the pharmacy serves the community in providing them with healthcare. So a human relationship in this case is replaced by a transactional service, which breaks down our sense of community and attachment. And then finally, the pharmacy becomes a space of consumerism rather than a space of well-being and this um, then defines our cultural understanding of what it means to be well what it means to be healthy in in this community in this society so as you can see the participation in this platform economy is producing a uh, is is driven by particular communicative processes which are producing a particular culture and way of knowing and i just want to ask um at a how i'm doing for time Yeah, you can maybe two minutes. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna then skip logistics brokerage and go. Oh, it's too bad to skip logistics brokerage. Okay, logistics brokerage very quickly, um, based on the idea of aggregation theory, as I mentioned, that new forms of distribution of goods um, uh, uh, is is meant to help producers and consumers find each other. And so basically we are getting positioned uh, through certain technicities, certain institutional arrangements as signaling devices and receptors, right? So we signal a need for something and we receive that something. And so it creates great networks of convenience, like I can order things, they show up at my house, but also it creates a culture of immediacy and a culture of an expectation of immediacy. So in this regard, I really like um, the comedy work of Ronnie Chiang, who has this fantastic riff on Amazon Prime in the United States being too slow, that when I press buy, I expect them to arrive at my house right now and put the item in my hand. I want them to send it to me before I even want it. So it's a fantastic cultural commentary on the immediacy that is produced by this sense of um, being a receptor and a, and a signaler in a network. Um, but this means that fulfillment comes to be defined as finding an item, not fulfillment being defined in terms of our relationship with others. So producers and consumers are out of step with each other in space and time. And it, again, we see this breakdown of community ties. And then finally with heteromation, we can think of the example of voluntary moderation um, through flagging of violent content on Facebook. This comes from my PhD student that I work with, Esteban Morales. He, he brought this example to my attention. So um, Facebook, if you are using this as a community space and you're working um, with a community that is um, maybe struggling with violent acts, um, you the, the technicity that you are afforded is to flag violent content. But this is a technicity that is really imbued with a great deal of emotion, right? So you have to see the content in order to be able to flag it. And so that means the platform becomes a space of violent acts. Those acts themselves are displaced in time. Um, but you as a citizen are expected to flag them in order to make the network space a safe space for you to be in connection with the other people that you're um, in communication with. And so this act produces knowledge and monetary value for the platform itself, but um, it produces a particular culture with the online space. And so we could see a culture of outrage arising out of this situation, outrage with the platform, because they're making money off of not moderating the content themselves and allowing us to and, and, and expecting us to do it um, with the technicity because it puts us in the position of having to experience um, violent imagery or with the message 
that goes along with all this. But what we're not maybe feeling outrage about is with the physical act of violence itself. And so we're seeing this kind of separation of community from the technological space. So some concluding thoughts on, on all of that, on, on the, how this relates to communication for development and participation. So for me, we are always participating in development or in one way or another. And the question is, how is that participation in development being transformed as our experience of, um, of community is shifted as these technologies pr pr produce a new sensorium and a new cultural mu uh, mutation using the language of Martin Barbero and um, Omar Rincon. So how do the current models of participation construct our social experience and what does this mean for the manifestation of social justice and equity? So I find that there's a really urgent need to make contemporary means of participation more transparent through digital literacy and citizen data audits so that we can kind of take back um, the spaces of interaction and commonality um, and take back uh, the construction of spaces of participation that are happening in ways that make sense to us. And um, that what we ultimately need to do is, is uh, do this so that we can think through how larger social processes shape the knowledge production and decision-making processes that happen at the community level. And that's it from me. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Catherine. A very interesting presentation. And then, um, you know, looking at uh, participation, especially online participation um, in, in a different way. Um, so I'd like to invite um, Dr. Ricardo Ramirez uh, to act as a discussant. Maybe when Dr. Ramirez starts a uh, discussion with Dr. Uh, Catherine Reilly, we, we can also you know, have some questions from the audience. Thank you, Atta Harold and Catherine. That's a hard act to follow. Um, I'm going to tell you how I wanted to frame the response to each of the presentations today. There was a statement placed in chat during the second of this series that wrote, in the digital age, is it not the time to retire participation as it avoids the intangibles of digitalized people thinking, doing, and acting? Is it time to retire participation? And I thought that was a very provocative question that came from somebody in the second session. And I wrote it down because I thought I need to, I need to shoot that one down um, because I don't believe it's time to retire it. And what I liked about your presentation is, um, first of all, your, your reference to Martin Barbero's work, um, the sensorum and the cultural mutations. I too have a hard time following that diagram. So the more you brought examples, the more it started to make sense. So thanks for that. I think what's interesting is that communication for development, the way I grew up with it in my early profession, had a project basis. It was stuck in the old uh, international development project structure. And what Martin Barbero is bringing is a, a new gestalt, a new backdrop that is more political, economic, historical. So I think that's refreshing. Um, the the examples that you brought, because I'm a visual thinker, made me understand some of these notions. And I'll give you three examples of things that, that connected with me in your presentation. The analogy with the farmer's market was perfect. I have worked at the farmer's market as a vendor and as a customer, and the relations, the quality of relationships that come out of that and having customers regularly and asking about the farm and asking about the produce and so on. Um, that analogy that you that you mentioned was right on because as you digitalize this as as a focus is the service or the one time occasion as opposed to the relationship, I totally understood where you were going with that. Um, I had an experience with uh, testing an app an app one time so that's called Waze that many of you may know, which is like Google Maps on steroids. And uh, my wife and I were heading somewhere and we needed to make sure we got there in time. And so we loaded this up onto the phone and found it in a way surprisingly amazing and scary at the same time. It would tell us when there was a policeman waiting for us, uh, which I thought was good. It would tell us when there was a traffic accident and we, how we had to reroute, which I thought was great. But then it started to tell us which other cars that we were seeing on the road also had it. That I started starting one, wondering what this was all about. 
to make a, story, a long story short, we very quickly realized that we were a data provider. So very much your logistical brokerage, blindly doing that until they told us that all these other cars had it as well. And then we proceeded to unload it or take the app off the phone, which was almost as hard as dismantling the phone. It had a built-in architecture where deleting the app took enormous effort. And so that was an effort at abandoning a platform where I felt manipulated, as your example with uh, the pharmacies in Peru. Um, and so the whole idea of, of transparency, I, I must congratulate you that your research with the citizen data audits is actually action research. You're intervening and learning about it as you're doing that. So that's, uh, that's very respectable. And I even wondered whether um, this may come up with a new ladder of participation in the digital age. We talked about the la different ladders of participation uh, I had shared three, you mentioned there were more. And perhaps this framework of the notification, logistics brokerage and heteromation may bring a new ladder because the key word is transparency. So I thought that was really provocative. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you, Ricardo. I was feeling very nervous about this presentation because it the stuff is so, I'm having a hard time putting it on the ground. And so I'm glad to hear that it connected. Um, because I, I am struggling with the ephemeralness of the theories and trying to put them on the ground in a, in a concrete way and think about like how, what does this actually mean for somebody who is a producer, right? And, and is going about their daily life. Um, we, can, we can also take uh, any question from our audience, if there is anyone. Well, uh, uh, while, while people think about that, I wanna just, um, respond to Ricardo's question about, do we still need to think about participation? And I think either way, like maybe we don't wanna think about it in the same way as you've signaled, but either way, we do need to understand that people can and do become engaged in spaces that are spaces of decision-making. And because ultimately at the end of the day, for me, the literature on participation is about who gets to make the decision and how is the decision made? And so we need to always be studying that. There's always gonna be you know, the question of who gets to make the decision, how is the decision made and how do we make that process more democratic? It's just that the context for that conversation is shifting maybe. And so the, 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 we, we shouldn't stop studying participation. We just might need to be looking at it slightly differently is how I would answer that. You, you make me think of soft systems methodology, Peter Checkland, that says that whoever owns the problem should own the solution to that problem. So with media, it's not only owning the media, it's owning the chance to participate in shaping the structure of the media, the message. The, so that's quite interesting. Who is the author? Sorry. Peter Checkland. And it's soft systems methodology. Yeah, I was wondering if there is any question from our audience. Um, please, you can use the chat box. Maybe we have two minutes to wrap up, um, or you can open your camera and ask question to Catherine. Or I'm also happy, it might be interesting to see some of the other presentations and things will come back around, so we can do that as well. Okay, no, I, th I found it's very interesting, Catherine. It makes me, you know, very clear sense of, you know, looking at online participation from using issues or justice issues that you bring. Um, and um, you also talk about uh, digital literacy. I think that's also one of the work. This is Gordon Gao. We are, we are also working on technology stewardship um, to contribute that front. Uh, very interesting. Um, so if there is no other question, uh, Ricardo, any, any, any other thought, last thought that you want to share? No, I, I think um, the, this whole sense of being manipulated into producing goods without knowing it that um, Catherine is mentioning is, is new to me. It, uh, but I think the, the examples that she's bringing up suddenly make the theoretical part really, um, really relevant. So I really welcome that. Okay, so with that, we, you know, uh, we want to conclude the discussion session and um, let us join to thank our speaker and also uh, Catherine Reilly and Ricardo. We take it, you know, this class and- uh, yeah. I love this, I love this. I don't know the class, it's the best. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um,
So um, now uh, we like to move to our second presentation uh, by Dr. Tia Tirol and Thea Araneta, uh, both are from College of Development Communication from University of Philippines, Los Benios. And they will be discussing uh, situation analysis, communication situation analysis for a disaster risk communication project for which there is a change in methodology from face-to-face -to, -face to online. The floor is yours. Good day, everyone. Thea and I will be sharing some insights about our online experiences in our ongoing project on risk communication for development. Next. The Philippines ranks third with the highest risk worldwide. 60% of our land is exposed to multiple hazards, resulting in annual losses at 8 million US dollars. The top-down approach from the central government has been used to download plans, policies, and funds relating to disaster risk reduction and management. But there is also a growing recognition for the strong need for communities to participate, not just as receivers, but as co-planners and co-implementors. The pandemic has shown that communication is vital for people during a crisis. In the context of disaster risk reduction and management, participatory efforts have focused on hazard mapping and risk assessment. There has been several work on communication, particularly on how people perceive risk and how they act on these platforms. But more needs to be done on participatory community-based efforts in planning for disaster risk reduction and management, including risk communication. Next, please. Our project is part of a three-year program funded by the National Research Council of the Philippines and implemented by the UPLB College of Development Communication. It has three sub-projects. The first in, is on communication assessment. The second deals with the actual implementation of the risk communication plan. And the third is on a short-term evaluation of the program. Next. The three projects are implemented in phases following participatory communication for development planning. We are now in phase one. Project one aims to assess the community's situation and environment in terms of communication. The main data to be gathered include the key communication issue identified by the stakeholders, existing policies and programs affecting their community, organizations and stakeholders involved, and communication resources available in the community. This data will be gathered through participatory communication appraisal methods. Next, please. In January 2020, we received the GO signal to proceed with the project. We immediately prepared the administrative requirements, collected secondary data, and identified the project sites. Then the lockdown happened. For over five months, our project literally stopped. By the end of 2020, we decided to fast track most of the activities that we needed to do. Many difficulties hampered the project ranging from log logistical to administrative to even health status of a team member. But we saw the need to push through. Natural hazards do not cease even during a pandemic. So in March 2021, we conducted an orientation workshop and the online training for our area coordinators. This will be followed by the PRCA workshop with the community and validation workshop to confirm the PRCA results in the next coming months. Next slide, please. We have three project sites identified with the help of the Department of Science and Technology. These areas are communities prone to deep-seated landslides. One site is in Benguet in northern Philippines. The other is in Samar in the central region. And the third is in Bukidnon in southern Philippines. These sites have different quarantine restrictions, some with stricter lockdown due to a surge in COVID-19 cases. Next. We were supposed to conduct our project activities face-to-face. -face. The project team would travel to the selected sites, 
make courtesy calls with community officials, visit the community and discuss the project. Then we will hold the PRCA workshop and collect data on site. And after some time, we will return to the community to conduct a validation workshop. With the pandemic, we decided to shift from face-to-face -to, -face to online mode. Instead of the project team doing the legwork in the communities, we look for area coordinators. We encourage the community to select its area coordinators with one coordinator being a member of the Disaster Risk Reduction Management Officer. One site chose three younger staff members of the DRRA office. Another site chose three local counselor, counselors from the barangay or the village. And the third site chose three older and more experienced staff from the local government unit. So far, we have completed the online training of the area coordinators on how to conduct situation analysis using participatory communication appraisal tools. Next, please. Here is a snapshot of the training workshop. Last March 29 and 30, we had an online training for the area coordinators on participatory communication development planning and participatory communication appraisal that we would ask them later to coordinate, facilitate, and conduct among households of the villages included in the project. Next, please. After the short lectures, the participants work on the specific tool or process discussed. For example, they work on a Venn diagram of the organization in their communities that they can partner with. UPLB project team members were assigned to moderate and facilitate each breakout session room of each project site. For the setup, each project site has four area coordinators and they were in their own offices during the online training. Each site used one laptop, but we requested them that they will always turn their cameras on during the online workshop. Next, please. During the last day of the workshop, each site was requested to share all the outputs they work on with other project area coordinators and the project team. Next slide, please. With the move to online activities for Project 1, we have observed some initial insights. We group them into two key ideas, realizations in the use of the online platform to conduct communication activities, and some notes on the idea and practice of stakeholders' participation. Thea will now proceed with our presentation. Thank you. So. Um... In terms of using online platforms such as Zoom, Messenger, chat, or emails for coordinating with and conducting the initial training with stakeholders, we observe that it has highlighted the administrative difficulties on both ends of the project implementer and the project sites. By its very nature, uh, participatory and community-based activities are extremely hard to pin down amidst the bureaucratic process on the implementing agency, the funding agency, and the community. So even as the mode of communication had gone online, the administrative papers remain, required remain paper-based. We handed down bulk of the paperwork, such as securing locations, meals, etc., to the area coordinators. Uh, though they will have some allowance in serving as coordinators, the workload might affect their desire to continue participating in the project. Likewise, even as we think that most of the country is connected to the internet, Having connection is really different from having good and stable internet connection, which is needed for better participation in an online event. Uh, these three sites all have slow and intermittent internet connection. So during the training, there was a need to adjust the pace and of the lectures and activities. There was also the need to trust them that they are listening or participating even without other cues due to the slow con internet connection. This has implication in doing online participatory communication work in the Philippines. Perhaps it can be done in phases, but not at the start and not for the whole of the project. Additionally, the online platform provided us accessible ways for the training, but it removed the extra dimension of being fully with the participants, going to their areas and mingling with them in their own locations. Likewise, during the training, there were too many distractions for them and it was easier to tune out during Zoom trainings and not be fully present for both the facilitators and the participants. Next. 
we also observed some insights on how the project approached participation and how the stakeholders uh, participated in this online, initial online activities of the project. First, whether online or offline, we worked in the same structure and realities on the ground of the communities. We still had to do the route of coordinating with key local stakeholders and gatekeepers first. The availability of the digital and online platforms uh, has not changed this due to the limitations of the community to be reached and particularly the context we are working on, which is risk communication. It's crucial to inform local officers in charge of DRM or disaster risk management. These officers are usually local appointees and hence are in a position of power over the community members uh, we aim to specifically reach for the project. Secondly, when all project site area coordinators were brought together in one training, uh, we observed an increased sense of wanting to participate in something big and with the other. One coordinator said during the sharing that they see other coordinators in other sites as teammates and colleagues working on a, something for their respective communities. There could also be the sense of competition that their site is doing well in terms of DRN since the other participants were also local DRN staff in their respective sites. In a face-to-face -face setup, we would normally just visit one site at a time and they would usually not know what the other sites are doing or working on. After the training, there were also calls for the creation of a Facebook page to showcase activities done in the project. Uh, many local governments uh, units now in the country are very particular with their use of social media to broadcast and document their activities. We are, after all, a social media crazed country. Making their participation known and shown via social media could be uh, driven by personal institutional needs. This could also serve as a virtual network for showcasing, benchmarking, and serving as motivation to continue. Third, the change in methodology made us revisit the steps necessary to conduct the participatory com appraisal. The training held among area coordinators also served as data gathering for the project since the coordinators were trained how to do the activities and how to facilitate uh, themselves. They also answered and they also answered and went through the activities themselves. So in a face-to-face -face setting, the project team would just go to the area and conduct the workshop. We uh, Initially, we also had plans of developing a guide, but for doing the communication appraisal, but it was only after the, it would it, sh it should have been only after the whole workshop was completed. But now we have drafted a guide before the workshop for the use of the area coordinators. Uh, the pandemic has limited the UPLB team's physical movement. So our area coordinators, the local leaders became more like our project teammates. In a sense, we are somewhat more detached as outsiders and researchers, but more put in place and not pretending to be part of their community. The area coordinators were trained to do what we should do, albeit in a crash course setting. One coordinator mentioned that he would really like to learn how to do the participatory communication uh, appraisal so they can use it in their own line of work. This gave us a sense that letting them work on the process, even as the gatekeepers of the community, would give them more ownership of it. They are not just mere attendees to the workshop also. Um, so to summarize, two areas we reflected on were the use of the online platform for participatory communication activities and some implications on our notion and practice of participation after the shift to online. Uh, as next step, moving forward, the project would like the project team would like to reflect and learn from the workshops that we will conduct in the coming months in terms of the practical aspects of using online platforms as well as observing how stakeholders participate in this setting. We will most likely need to also reflect and reassess the readiness of the community to participate in both the aspects of technology and access, as well as, well as participation uh, for the succeeding projects of the overall DRM program. Amidst the pandemic, we may be forcing them to take a note of another thing in, the, in their mind, the natural hazard they face. Um, Participation of the local leaders via the DRM officers are okay, but we're thinking how about the participation of the community itself. Though the project will provide some physical support for their internet connectivity, such as Wi-Fi modems and prepaid cards for paying internet costs, we will still see if there are enough, if these are enough to ensure their continued participation or if there could be additional layers of trainings and preparations for them. 
uh, this is the first time we will attempt to do a purely online participatory communication initiative and everything is still in its initial stages and so we hope to learn more from the panel here as well thank you very much for your time thank you uh dr Tyrrell and arnetta very interesting um presentation um so i i'd like to uh, invite ricardo again to to join us as a discussion and share your thoughts about this presentation and your audience you can also raise your hands um if you have any question um yeah or, or use the chat box thank you atta so thea and maria stella this is uh, this you just sent me back in time because i did some many years ago work in something similar to participatory communication appraisal in the Philippines. Um, and in one occasion, a typhoon came in, which got in the way of our field work. And luckily I was in a very nice residence at UPLB and survived it. Um, so when you talk about disaster risk management, I, my mind goes back to watching trees fly over the road. Um, several thoughts came to mind as you were talking. The, the one is, how tough it must have been for you to do a shift from a PRCA workshop, the ways I'm familiar with them, to doing this online. And how central it was to, you mentioned that the area team coordinators that you trained ended up becoming more like teammates. And I have a feeling that what you just described there is being mirrored worldwide. I'm, a, I'm now doing a lot of international development work in the evaluation field and I am more and more dependent on working with local evaluators who become teammates. Even when the COVID pandemic ends, I doubt I'll be flying away to all these places as much. Um, but that does change the dynamic a lot. And you mentioned, it was a slide where you talked about performing participation and I didn't know if that was a good thing or bad thing. I wasn't sure whether you were <laughs> indicating that by joining this Facebook, they were proud of being more involved and demonstrating locally their engagement or whether they were playing the game of the PRCA. And I thought it maybe had double meaning. But the other thing that made me wonder, and maybe you want to comment on that, is by changing gears and working remotely, the timing of your work changed. You may have had possibly more flexibility than if you had scheduled workshops where you went in on a pre-scheduled time. So the timing issue uh, struck me. The other one is who is being left out? Even if you did a PRCA the traditional way, there's always people left out that you just, they don't show up because they can't. And to what extent does the, the context of doing it remotely exact, make that worse or not? Um, and then um, the last thing I wanted to mention that I that thought was quite interesting is um, how similar the PRCA work is to uh, Gordon and Atta's presentation in the, in the second webinar of their um, community engagement in uh, Sri Lanka and the Caribbean in engaging people in shopping around critically to see which media they need. So it's almost like what Gord and uh, Atta were doing in those countries is a new manifestation of PRCA. I'm wondering about that. And the last point I wanted to finish is with a story that um, when we did that project with FAO in the Philippines, they, uh, one of the communities decided from very early on that they wanted to own the media to, to do their, in this case, it was ag extension. And it was called Radio Tucunan, it's in, in Mindanao. And they bought the equipment they bought the generator, the, the local transmitter. They decided on the programming. And years later, I bumped into somebody. I was I'm not sure if it was you, Maria Stella, at, um, at the conference in Rome or somebody else who said to me, guess what? Radio Tucunan is still there. And I said, well, finally, we have a success of a media that was adopted and owned locally. And they said, well, except you guys made a mistake when you did your participatory appraisal. You did look at land ownership. And all of those farmers who, thanks to this new extension system, have higher production, now high, higher, higher rents from the landowners, and they're just as poor. <laughs> so there you go, An, a, a happy story with a, with, a, with a sad ending. So anyway, these are thoughts um, that I thought were so interesting for your example. So my main question to you is, 
how did the timing issue it was what were the benefits and the, the, the limitations of the online in terms of the the pace the timing when this happened Leia, would you like to go first or would you <laughs> to go first? I'll, I'll try to answer the question thank you uh ricardo for that um i think it will have a different answer also if it was in a non-pandemic time if we tried it in a non-pandemic because there's Currently, we have so many administrative roadblocks that even if it's very accessible that we just contact them by email or Zoom, all the other processes take so much time that if you notice, we, we, we did the workshop last March and we, we wanted to have done the workshops before this conference, uh, I think May. But there was um, so many difficulties brought about by the pandemic that even if the online, even if it was online with, and they have internet connection and we have internet connection and we can do it online, there was so much difficulty of how do we put the people together? Will we, um, will we violate health protocols by putting them all in one hotel room? Because they don't have individual internet connections at their houses. And so... We wanted the workshop to be in one location. The area coordinators will facilitate. We will be the one overseeing via Zoom, but it will be in, in as close to a PRCA as if we are there, except that we are online. So it was hard to organize that. So it, it took us some time and we still don't know if it will pan out in the coming months because there's so many difficulties right now. But coordination-wise, it's been very... Uh, it's it's easier. Our research assistants are, are able to call or text or even mess chat the the um, the area coordinator. So maybe in the non pandemic, it would be easier to just you you set up a workshop there and we'll just oversee via Zoom. And I think that's easier. But uh, yes, yeah. Another, yeah, another experience is that it shortened. The, the online uh, the oh, online yes. uh, workshops were literally shortened. When initially, if we're going to go to the field, we will conduct a three-day workshop, no? But because of the limitations in Zoom and people will get uh, easily bored or tired, so we just con imagine the three-day workshop was shortened into a one-day, right? Thea, was it one day? A two-day, a two-day workshop. And we just really... Uh, focus on the key facts, key information. Remove all the elaborations. This is the step. This is how you do it. Then we uh, we divide them into breakup rooms. Then you apply the Venn diagram. You apply the problem tree. You apply the ranking. You apply uh, communication resource mapping. But we were doing the facilitation. And after that, they would share their outputs and their results. So I think uh, uh, there was flexibility in there and also flexibility in terms of the different uh, sites being able to listen and share their outputs, which we could not do if we are going to do it uh, in a face-to-face -face, uh, situation or face-to-face -face setting. Uh, Dr. And Terrell these are just and some of that. Aneta, yeah. thank you. Thank you for uh, Ricardo. A very interesting discussion. We have uh, um another presentation i i like to again you know thank you uh, thank for, you for your wonderful contribution um and uh, so now uh we are in our last presentation and uh, i like to invite dr helen hamley udame professor of school of environmental design and rural development at the university of guelph dr hamley will bring her perspective on connectivity access and civic participation based on her work on Rural Broadband Initiative in Ontario. The floor is yours, Dr. Hamley. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, if I could just have the sharing control, please. I think someone else is yeah, on. Yeah, you, you, have, you have the now sharing control, yeah. So while my presentation is, is coming up, I just want to say how pleased I am to be here with um, some new friends and some old friends, and uh, to also sort of say that I shared Catherine's, um, uh, you know, Catherine's uh, concern uh, in being invited by Dr. Chowdhury to join this round table because the focus wasn't on my international work and, and the work I've done for now, you know, almost 40 years outside of Canada uh, in international development related um, 
agricultural and rural uh, extension, but more on my, my work here in Canada. And I always found that, that I had the tremendous fortunate um, uh, sort of experience of working outside of Canada before I actually worked inside of Canada. So I reflected on that uh, and um, looked at uh, bringing a presentation to a global communication for development uh, roundtable about uh, work here in rural Ontario, rural Canada. And so uh, my focus is really going to be on the topic of rural internet access and what's happened uh, during COVID and, um, and now going on and why that matters. And so uh, just a, a quick overview, I'm gonna take you through sort of the, the ideas, the thinking and a little bit of the theory and, and, and uh, the argument, and then talk a little bit about uh, conceptual um, approaches emerging now with uh, COVID-19 experiences and some examples and then, and then wrap up. So just to begin, um, this round table is so exciting because we are recognizing in our sub-discipline of communication for development or communication uh, for social change that we're almost a hundred years with literature in this area relevant to this literature. It's coming up to a hundred. And if we think back, we really had some rotten roots in, in our field. And we're all who work in this area are very well aware that the communication models that were inspired by modernization, the work of SRAM and Lerner and others really saw and hoped for a passing of rural society um, or traditional society. It was the passing in the English notion of dying, of, of, of letting it go or, or going past it or killing it off. And even as we moved into uh, the literature that um, was responsible for forming uh, ideas around um, the diffusion of innovations and extension, Roger's work in particular, that modernization mindset was, was very resistant to change. And it really took scholars from the global south like Bill Chan and, and Manuza more recently and, and many others, including our dear Nora Cabral from the Philippines and uh, the uh, the College of Development Communication to really challenge um, many of these, these models, these mental models of communication for development. And certainly the work of individuals like Paula Ferreri um, really rejected not just the, um, uh, the dominance of, of Western hegemonic thought in his own Brazil, but he called on the rest of the world, including countries like Canada, to recognize it within the, within the North and, and to call out or name, as Oscar Hamer says, the, um, the, the global South in Western nations. And that's the sweet spot that I saw for my work on, on rural broadband here in Canada that I'll, I'll come back to. So on this slide, we just see many of the areas, including contributions by, by Ricardo and, and Wendy Quarry here in Canada, and um, really important um, practitioner theorists like uh, Alfonso Damasio de Gran, who have really brought um, uh, this immense uh, literature um, into being, but more importantly, the engagement of our scholarship. Our scholarship does not, in communication for development, communication for social change, does not happen extraneously to actual lived experience. And for me, this, this is the, the real inspirational aspect methodologically, but also epistemologically. So now, um, how do I pull this into the work that I do here in rural Ontario, rural Canada? Well, we have about 30 years of literature around this concept of the information superhighway in Canada and, and why it's unequal, why it's unreliable, why it's inequitable in terms of the kinds of communications that are available. And, and here I'm talking about telecommunications specifically. So areas that are, can be wired um, with fiber optics or, or coaxial cable and others that um, uh, must make do on uh, more legacy technologies like copper telephone lines or um, early generation fixed wireless systems. 
And so the, the controversies and the, controversies and the, the contested sort of um, issues in this area have been known for a very long time. And of course, there is public dollars, taxpayers' dollars, investing in improved uh, broadband deployment in rural areas. Um, this whole experience hit an absolute total peak this last couple of years. So for many years, people like myself and others have, have tried to, 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 to raise the call to rural broadband and, and basically uh, dropped on, on um, deaf ears. But this past 12 months has been absolutely extraordinary and continues to be so, where all of a sudden more and more Canadians, especially those living in urban areas, have got a sense of what it's like to live on the wrong side of, of the digital divide. And here is where knowing and the data and mobilizing becomes really exciting. Now, this is the official look at our digital divide, our urban rural digital divide in Canada. And by official, I say, this is the official speak. This is the status and the targets that are being proposed. And you can see that right now around um, the early part of the um, uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic and, and into 20. 2021, you see this very large uh, divide between the urban and rural areas and a very large um, unprecedented injection of funding from the federal, provincial and local governments to improve connectivity in rural Canada. But this is official speak and official targets and many of us actually know that the situa situation is much worse. It's much more unequal, it's much more unreliable and it's very contested. Broadband is deeply technical. It's a vast infrastructure, as we all know, of many kinds of technologies, including some that are evolving, like low Earth orbit constellations of, of satellite uh, coverage, uh, running all sorts of different cloud-based applications, including those that uh, Catherine and, and Ricardo were talking about earlier. And uh, here in Canada, 91% of the backbone that runs this infrastructure is owned by three companies. And I say three because one of them is in current process to merge. That's Rogers and TELUS. So what's on paper and what's in reality are really quite glaring when it comes to rural broadband. And it's really worthwhile being able to look at pulling the technical from the social and institutional. And a good example of this is the current fascination with 5G. Here in Canada, rural communities are, are, are being fed a line to say that 5G is going to fix their problems. When in fact, this, is, this uh, evolution in mobile broadband is, is not necessarily coming along without its own complications and, and challenges. And we heard that in other um, uh, presentations here in the association. What's interesting from uh, a communication for development and social change perspective is that you have a perpetuation of the underdeveloped and the undeveloped in the discussion of rural broadband. And in fact, I would argue Samir Amin's concept of maldevelopment is much more applicable to this area. And framing of the haves and the have-nots have recently changed quite a bit because of COVID-19. So here I kind of try to schematize um, the idea that there's a number of communities in Canada who, who are served and they don't really see an issue. They're uh, stakeholders who say, you know, we've invested, it's working, we don't need to pay attention. Then there's some that in the rural areas in particular that have no interest and had no interest for quite a number of years of doing anything to improve connectivity and digital participation in their communities. There were a number who were unserved and really were divested. They were divested by the political and socio-technical uh, institutions. And they actually sort of internalized this idea that, that we're underserved and nobody cares about us. So why do we worry about it? Or why, why don't we just accept it and move on? And then there was a group that of, of so-called have-nots that always wanted to protest and find the data to show that they were underserved and to challenge the current um, uh, experience or current reporting on connectivity at the community level. So what's happened in a nutshell in Canada in the last 12 to 18 months is a whole contestation or fighting back against being served and being underserved. And this is a deeply participatory movement in my, in, in my perception of, of, the, of the literature on ComDev and communication for social change. 
In fact, the global literature on ComDev and communication for social change, combined with some of the recent, recent, more recent work around the knowledge society and invasive technification from uh, Gerard Boma's uh, concept, really help us to understand what's happening in rural broadband in a way that we, we didn't see it really before. Here it's the rejection that basic service is service and the fighting back of communities and individuals to say that they are not served, that they are underserved and that the quality of service and the performance targets set up by the federal government, followed by the provincial government and implemented by the private sector companies that own our infrastructure are really um, open for scrutiny. The, the reporting and the data collection has not been transparent and, ex and accessible and that business as usual in the telecoms world won't work. I see Adderhul's coming on screen, so it means I'm probably gonna have to wrap up. But let me go forward. I know, uh, I know there's some discussion. We have many examples in the um, project that I'd like to draw attention to, and you can visit our website to see many of the examples. But if I could just briefly uh, take a moment to say one of the big accomplishments of the last year has been really fighting this definition of rural served areas. So served areas in rural area in Canada. And here um, around Guelph, uh, where, where I'm sitting right now today, and the data and the mapping that we've been able to do has really challenged this concept of what is rural broadband, who has it, where is it, and how do we know that it's quality of service. As well, there's been a major online digital engagement during COVID-19 by major municipalities like Hamilton, City of Hamilton, to find out whether or not constituents and citizens in their communities are being served. And this is really important because all of the online uh, learning at the elementary and high school level is moved online. And we are tracking in real time how farm kids in particular are so disadvantaged in the online classroom. Sorry, I missed one slide. I'll just flag it. You can go back and have a look at it another time. And this is the charge to participating in the digital um, experience coming from groups from public health. So whereas public health has not necessarily gotten out of its behavioral change communication models, here they are with the work they're doing on social change communication and creating um, sort of almost manifestos at the international level, we might call them, but recommendations on how people can get out of the digital divide and call um, public services to account as well as the private providers. So just to wrap up, COVID-19 has been a major disruptor in this field of research. And it's, it's meant that we're able to draw attention and put up the data and juxtapose it against the official speak um, in a way that we weren't able to do before and as researchers. And I think going forward, this is a pretty exciting time. And we're so fortunate to have that 100 years of literature from the global um, literature and, and scholarship to bring to bear here in Canada and our rural communities. So thanks very much. Thank you, Alan. Uh, very interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentation uh, linking broadband participation. Uh, so I, I'd like to invite Dr. Um, Ricardo Ramirez to, to share some perspective very quickly. We have five minutes uh, because this room will be shared with another you know, room. So uh, please, uh, Ricardo, go ahead. Helen, thank you for this. Uh, you and I share a common path in having worked in the South before Canada. So that really rang a bell. Um, just uh, two thoughts that came to my mind. Um, one was you didn't differentiate between rural and remote, and I wonder if that's still an issue, as it was when I was involved in this area before. The other one is I remember Brian Beaton, who was the, the architect behind KNET, which is a broadband network in northern Ontario, who used to always demand from government and from the monopolies that basic service was not enough. He wanted Toronto downtown standards in remote for good reasons. And it seems to me that the pandemic has awakened that same idea from what you were saying. And I would just say the one area that I'd love to hear more about in your presentation was that diagram that had all the little honeycomb where you were talking to telling us how ideas from the global south were shaping your analysis of the current situation. I'll stop there because there's so much more to digest. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I just got the message that we have some more minutes to approve. <laughs> yeah, so we can yeah, you know, go ahead. And... Shall I go ahead, Ada? Yeah, Helen, please respond. Okay, so just uh, really quickly, yeah, there's been a further differentiation between rural 
and I would add agricultural and rural remote. And, and, and this is quite important because the rural remote also includes a, a greater focus on spectrum issues and northern environments, as well as the uh, next generation SATCOM. Although here in rural Ontario, the emergence of um, Starlink, uh, Elon Musk's uh, uh, Leo, um, uh, is also a disruptor in the scene. So it's partly the technical dimension, but also socio-institutional. Socio and um, farming and agriculture has, has been part of the new wave of attention to rural broadband, playing a very critical role. And especially uh, for family farms who have uh, kids learning from home and, and people teleworking from home. And then the other uh, 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 question that you raised around, um, uh, I can't remember the second one, but the, the diagram, I can, I can go on to the diagram. Well, it's, it's how you're using um, ComDev oh, yeah. ideas from the South in this analysis. Yeah, and, and Brian Beaton's comment is, is, is absolutely um, concerned. One of the good examples is challenging basic service from the perspective of basic needs and strategic interests, a very strong development concept and especially a feminist development concept that's been challenged over the years, where the idea that good enough or just satisfying people's basic needs is enough. You give them food, water, shelter, they're enough development. And the pushback from, from many, many practitioner scholars in the development world where it's, it's really not, you need education, you need capital income opportunities, um, aspirational career pathways, you need uh, gender equality. And so strategic interests must uh, um, sort of fit with the basic needs. Same argument we can apply here in telecoms, where basic service isn't enough. There has to be a whole overlay of strategic interest to really make sure that internet access has a meaning. And a good example, and I glossed through that really quick with that honeycomb picture, is security. More than ever before, rural and agricultural um, users of connectivity are very concerned about invasive technification, as Boma calls it, and our, we're looking at the concept of evasive. So going to the rural to escape technification. And that to me is a fascinating um, new dimension of the, the work that we can look at. So not wanting um, invasive technification or having control, not just participation, but control over the security of one's own data within rural environments. I think Catherine has a question. Um, I did by this right now. It's yeah, like, yeah, oh, it's good. The connections between these presentations are phenomenal. Um, so, is can, I just I don't understand a lot about rural um, broadband in Canada. Is the I, I, were you are you saying that rural broadband extension in Canada is is happening because farming itself is becoming more digital? like they need the tractors to be able to connect to the internet? Is this what you're saying? So everything in rural is becoming more digital, not just agriculture, but um, yeah, that's part of it for sure. And part of the reason that agriculture is, is um, not just undergoing massive digitalization, but also um, generating or growing new crops of data. So being able to sell a product um, and, and, and move a data product that didn't exist before is because of improved connectivity. But it's a double-edged sword because the security dimension has become really important to agricultural producers and especially to family farms. Because now with um, converged media, everything from uh, drone technology to, um, to uh, any number of uh, GPS enabled um, applications, um, there is no privacy on farm and what's being done on farm. And so there's a number of really good case studies in Canada of how uh, privacy has been invaded and, and the security issue, including thefts from farms, um, crime on farms, against um, this, uh, violence against women on farms. These have become you know, major issues of the last um, two to three years that we didn't, we, we hadn't been seeing before. So it is a double-edged sword that's technification and there's many different trends. So it's not, not like we're drinking the Kool-Aid anymore that says rural broadband is so wonderful and everything's great. It comes along with its own, its own challenges. 
So then this makes me think of two sort of cultural issues that go alongside these political economy issues and security and, and governance issues and things like this. One of them is the fact that farmers know a lot about their soil and about, I'm from Manitoba, so like <laughs> from a farming background in a way, um, sort of one generation removed. And, you know, farmers know about their crops and their land and, and the moisture levels and things like this. And so with the datification of these processes, it's like their knowledge, it's getting taken out of their hands. So this is something that I find really fascinating in terms of how we produce a cult of rural culture and how our ways of knowing are transformed and this sort of thing, connecting back to this wider um, perspective on what does it mean to participate in these processes and what do they do to how we know ourselves and how we, our community culture is, is organized. And um, the other thing that it makes me think of, which is a bit of a reach, but um, in Canada right now, um, there, Manitoba is a rural area, a, an agricultural region of Canada, and it's having a really hard time with COVID. And one of the reasons that it's having a really hard time is because there are some traditional agricultural communities that are um, part of um, religious groups who are refusing to get vaccinated or to acknowledge um, the existence of COVID-19. And so Manitoba is in like full lockdown because of this. And the explanation is that these communities traditionally are suspicious of um, things like medical treatments and things because they've had bad experiences in the past. So then I think about, you know, these types of cultural transformations that are happening in the way that farming takes place and, and how you're saying that people are escaping to the countryside to ex escape these technical um, interventions. And as I say, I'm kind of like, drawing broad connections between two very different things here, but I start to see patterns, right, around um, people um, seeking out the escape from technology, but also it's kind of a removal from, you know, technical interventions. There's a lot to unpack there, I guess, is what I'm trying to say <laughs> in yeah. a very confused way. I just want to caution everyone to sort of look at both sides, because also, people are escaping to the rural areas because of COVID-19 from the urban areas because they're trying to uh, develop a closer relationship with nature during COVID-19. We didn't see this type of sort of um, environmental um, sort of close to nature, need to get out to nature type of movement pre-COVID. I mean, it certainly hasn't sped up the way it has in COVID. And this has changed a lot of, of, of more urban-centric, uh, you know, uh, sort of views on broadband. It's been one of the major reasons why um, temporary residents in rural in areas due to the COVID-19 um, experience have, have been calling upon municipalities and politicians for better connectivity. So it's it's going both ways. It's it's not like these are all, you know, technification is, is all, and digitalization, datification is all bad in rural and agriculture. There's also, you know, it, and it, you can't do good and bad in this area. It's just an immense amount of change and it's really peaked in the last two years. Yeah, very interesting discussion. I see uh, Gordon actually shared something around summer thread and Kelsey mentioned that this is a whole new arena in which companies want inputs that family farmers must buy. Um, Gordon, you wanted to, you have three minutes, you wanted to say something? Uh, just a question for Helen. So, you know, I, I've been reading uh, Kelly Bronson's work on this as well, uh, and her focus on inclusive innovation or what she calls responsible innovation. So are you seeing uh, any organizations or, or groups that are coming together to talk about these issues and, and that are inclusive in their intent uh, in terms of, you know, control over, you know, just raising awareness and sort of getting these issues on the table with these rural communities? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like there's a whole movement right now on on-farm experimentation in Canada, which my, my friends in the Philippines would go, well, yeah, of course, because there's been so much on-farm experimentation, uh, deep, you know, deep um, sort of collaborative research with farmers in the Philippines. And, and there's, um, you know, a strong return to that here in, in or not return, it's a strong movement to that in Canada and globally. And uh, I also want to sort of point out too that this is an issue that 
every single nation in the world is being affected by. We are really all in it together when it comes to what's happening in rural and, and agricultural context. And a good example is the work that I'm doing right now with Farm Radio International around radio plus technologies where all of a sudden inter, uh, artificial intelligence is now being built into um, sort of the intelligent agents where broadcast radio, FM, community radios also are involved. So going forward, you're going to start to see sort of more converged media in, in this context and uh, uh, data harvesting, not just growing the data and selling the data, but data harvesting that's taken out of the hands of farmers. And that becomes a, a big issue, obviously. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting uh, discussion. I think we are almost on time. Uh, like what time do we got? 10 minutes, <laughs> what time approval? Um, let us continue the discussion, and um, with that, I, I'd like to conclude our third presentation and discussion and uh, this session. And, and thank you very much, everyone, uh, for joining us, and our especially our speakers and um, you know our discussion and our audience. Uh, I'd like to really thank everyone. Um, for that. Um, so have a wonderful weekend and also rest of you know the productive time with CCA. I think the uh, networking lounge is still continuing, so you can join and have some networking. And um, bye for now. Thank you, Ada Harul, for organizing. Really, really lovely experience. Thanks. Stella. Thank you, everyone. And Bea, everyone, Ricardo, Catherine, Ada. Thank you all.